Hey, what's up, Good Life? Thanks for joining me for today's 128 moment. You know, over the last few weeks of us sort of being stuck in our house and sort of the world grinding to a halt, there's been one thing to look forward to in terms of sports. Every Sunday night, I've been tuning in to The Last Dance, checking out the documentary on the story of Michael Jordan's career, in particular their pursuit of their sixth and final NBA championship with the Chicago Bulls. And it's been amazing to be reminded of his greatness. I remember looking back to when I was a third grader in North Carolina in 1982 and being a UNC Tar Heel fan and watching them win the national championship by this freshman, this skinny freshman hitting the final shot and his name was Michael Jordan. At that moment, I was a fan for life, following his career through college and into the pros and pulling for him and celebrating those successes and just recognizing, you know, even as it was happening, like we're watching one of the best of all time and thinking back through all he's accomplished and seeing that on the documentary of, you know, the five league MVPs, the six NBA championships, the six finals MVPs, and who knows how many Air Jordans that he sold, all these impacts on and off the court. But as I was watching the documentary and as, you know, being reminded of his greatness, there was something that really struck me. That there were so many moments when he was being interviewed where he just looked sad. And it wasn't where his tears would, where his eyes would well up with tears, but it wasn't just because he's looking back on some joyous moment. It wasn't just because he's looking back on some moment of personal loss, like when his, de- when his father was killed. It was moments where it seemed like he ought to have been satisfied, where it ought to have been enough, or he ought to be able to go, I would have loved more, but I'm so thankful for what I had. And yet I just sort of saw in him this nagging suspicion that he still hasn't found what he's looking for. And I think in the life of Michael Jordan, we can see he's accomplished everything you could possibly accomplish as a professional athlete. He's probably still to this day, one of the top 10 most recognizable faces on the planet. And he's not played a game since 2003. And yet at this point in his life, at least from an outside observer, it seems he still He still hasn't found what he's looking for. And I'm afraid we could do the same thing if we define success the way the world does. We talked this weekend about the life of Joseph, about how he left an enduring legacy because he knew the story of his life wasn't his story. He was a small part in God's big story. And I think we have to remember that as well, that we can't define success as the world defines it. Michael Jordan had incredible success, but it was all for a kingdom that will not last. We are called to serve a kingdom that will never fade away, the kingdom of God. And we can do everyday things that end up having an enduring impact because we do them with the right focus. If we measure success as God measures it, as obedience to him and to his will, by making our lives the glory of God and the proclamation of the gospel, no matter what we're doing, then we can be successful from a heavenly perspective. In Colossians 3, it speaks to this very powerfully. In verse 23, it says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. That whatever we do, We work heartily for the Lord. And let's take it a step further. In verse 17, it says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's our call. That's our mission. And if we begin to define success as the world defines it, we could reach the end of our lives and still be sitting there saying, I haven't found what I'm looking for. And I believe that can happen to those who are saved, that we can have our confidence in eternity, our hearts surrendered to Christ, and we, and we can be saved, but we could have kept a compartment to ourselves. Let's say it's our career. Let's say it's our family. Let's say whatever it may be, that we've kept that to ourselves, and we've allowed the world to define success in that area. And if we've done that, we might reach a point in this life or the next where we look at our lives and go, I missed it. I spent my life pouring out for a kingdom that will not last. But if we will take everything that we do and have it be defined by who Jesus is and who he's called us to be, then we won't ever have to look at our lives and say we missed it. I missed the boat. I invested in something that faded away. So let me give you three ways that we can do that. The first is this, to redefine success. There were so many moments in the life of Joseph that we've looked at over the last few weeks that the world would have said he's failing miserably. And yet, those moments that we would call failure as humans were steps of obedience toward a a lifetime of success in the eyes of God. 
So we have to redefine success. Define success as obedience to God in that moment, doing exactly what God would want us to do. We also have to refocus our work. We have to make sure we are giving an effort that, that is toward Christ and recognizing that no matter what work we do, we are doing it heartily to the Lord and we're doing it in the name of Jesus. That our work, whether it be sacred work or secular work, I don't even believe in those two things. Whether it's preparing a sermon or preparing a sales meeting, no matter what you're doing as the activity, that can be an act of worship. We need to begin to see our work as worship, workship, that we are doing whatever we are doing, but we're doing it with Jesus as the purpose, as the reason, as the power, and as the goal. We need to redefine or refocus our work. And the third thing is this, to reset our expectations. When we look at our lives, we measure our success by this award or that award or this promotion or that promotion. But sometimes failure in the world's eyes is success in the eyes of God. We need to redefine our, we need to reset our expectations, recognizing that we're not the ones who set the course, recognizing that we have to expect the unexpected and recognize that the storyteller knows exactly what he wants to tell through our little story. And if we've done that, then we've been successful. Good life, I hope that encourages you today and hope it challenges you today as we look toward you know, our state and our nation, hopefully reopening and having this opportunity to maybe set reset on our own lives and how we approach our work. I hope it challenges you as much as it challenges me. Love you guys, miss you guys, and we'll see you tomorrow at 128.